This is Beyond the Big Screen Podcast with your host, Steve Guerra. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Big Screen Podcast, where we talk about great movies and stories so great they should be movies. Find show notes, links to subscribe, and leave Apple Podcast reviews by going to our website, beyondthebigscreen.com. And now, let's go Beyond the Big Screen. Welcome back to Beyond the Big Screen. As Mustache Chris and I wind our way through the mafia on film and in real life. Today, we are going to take a deep dive into a piece of mafia history that doesn't often come up as one of the big stories of the mafia. The Montreal Mafia, that is. The mafia in Canada wasn't a sideshow to the happenings in New York. The mafia in Montreal was the link with all of the major events in the golden age of the mafia and beyond. So let's look at the real story of the Montreal mob and its star, Don Vito Rizzuto. Chris, uh, what made you fall into this whole story of Vito Rizzuto and the Montreal mafia? Well, you had mentioned you wanted to do the show Bad Blood, or you told me to watch it. And I knew about Rizzuto being Canadian and uh, Montreal is not far away, not that far away from Toronto. And I knew a little bit about organized crime in Toronto myself. So, yeah, I did. I mean, it's it's big. It's, you know, it's a big story up here in Canada. Americans are probably not all that familiar with it, but Vito Rizzuto and we'll We'll get into it uh, as we go through the series Bad Blood, the Hells Angels and the West End Gang and the the street gangs in Montreal. It's and we're going to get into it in this episode, too, was was massive, especially the Hells Angels. It still is. It's still a massive criminal organization up here right now. That was really one of the big things that got me interested in Vito Rizzuto was the show Bad Blood was spectacular, and we're going to get into that. And it was one of the few TV shows and movies that I had seen in general that was so well done and stuck to the facts. But when you start scratching a little bit further, you see that there's even so much more to Vito Rizzuto and the whole uh, his whole family and the Montreal family that uh that we can get into. So let's just start off maybe with um, the Sicilian mafia and the mafia in Montreal and in Canada. What was going on with them during this early time in the mafia in the early 19th century up until the 1950s, 60s or so when Vito Rizzuto hits the scene? Yeah, so early in Montreal history, the majority of the mafia came from the region in Italy called Calabria. There was a lot of Sicilians too, but uh, a guy named uh, Vic Catroni. Vic uh, Catroni pretty much ran um, organized crime in Montreal, and he was of Calabrian descent. And most people aren't aware of this. There's like the La Cosa Nostra, which is the mafia in Sicily, and in Calabria, it's called the Indrangheta, which I just nailed. I'm very uh, <laughs> proud of myself. It's a very, if you saw the name, like, like spelt out, there's no way that you would think that's how it's pronounced, but it is how it's pronounced. Um, yeah, and uh, the Bonanno family, this is kind of where it kicks off a little bit, like early in the Bonanno family history, when Joseph Bonanno was still in charge, he wanted to... Uh, spread uh, the Bonanno family influence in different regions in the United States. And uh, Montreal was one of the areas that he wanted to expand into. Uh, Carmine Galanti, who is uh, basically uh, starting a lot of the heroin trafficking or a big chunk of it. The mafia had already, always been trafficking heroin, but the uh, like he tra- trafficked, trafficked uh, heroin like en masse. <laughs> He went up to Montreal and kind of set up a lot of the the interconnection between the Bonanno family and the Montreal family uh, in the uh, Catroni organization in Montreal. And it's weird because 
Bonanno family has always been known as more of the, the most Sicilian out of all the five families. And uh, the Catroni family was not entirely Calabrian, but it was it was ran by Calabrians for the most part. And the Sicilians were kind of pushed aside. But we're going to get into that a little bit later. And just to set the scene a little bit, Calabria is basically the boot and Sicily is the, the island that's getting kicked by the boot, you might say. And it's, it really is fascinating because I think as a, um, as an American and, you know, as, as much of an aficionado to, as the mafia as anybody, that it's not often very clear the difference between the Calabrian mafia and the mafia in Sicily, you just think, oh, they're Italians are all going to and come out in the wash. And that was basically the story in America that they had pretty much there. There was some conflict between Calabrians and uh, Sicilians, even in the uh, Costa La Marse wars of the um, the mustache peats and all that stuff. But it had kind of smoothed out after that point that there wasn't as much of a conflict in the U.S., at least, between Calabrians and Sicilian mafia organized crime. No, there's not. We'll get into the there's like a full on war that breaks out in Montreal, pretty much based around these uh, ethnic, I guess, like sub ethnic differences between the Italians or in the States. It was. I mean, the Sicilians would kind of hang out with the Sicilians and the Calabrians would hang out with the Calabrians. I know there was like a, I remember reading, there was like a big deal about John Gotti and he was a Neapolitan, right? That's how you pronounce Mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And uh, which is traditionally the Camorra region of Italy. I mean, he grew up with in the traditional Sicilian La Cosa Nostra but yeah, there was a lot of uh, Sicilians that were not very happy that he ended up becoming like a boss because of this, right? It was more petty squabbles in the States where in Montreal, it's going to break in, break out into full on war. Let's uh, bring Vito and Rizzuto into the story and maybe talk a little bit about his family and then Vito's uh, younger life. Yeah, so Vito was born in Aracula. Uh, I can't pronounce the town's name. It starts with a C. Can you give it a shot? Oh, um, Arac- Araclia Catolica or Catolica yeah. Araclia. Either I think it's Catolica Iracula, and it's a Sicilian city that it sounds like it's a little bit of a off the beaten path. But that seems to be where more of the hardcore mafia came from was not the big city but kind of these more uh, bumpkin towns, you might call them. Yeah, from my understanding, a lot of mafia guys came out of this particular town, uh, which I believe is only has a population of like 6,000 people or something like that. It's uh, it's when you think of like uh, picturesque, beautiful Sicily or Italy, uh, this town represents it, basically. Um, yeah, but him and his... so. They moved to, I think they stopped off in Nova Scotia for a little bit, and then they immediately went to Montreal. There's just a little more backstory. Uh, Niccolo, who's Vito's father, he married into the pretty much mob royalty back in Sicily. Uh, Mano, I believe his name was. So Vito was basically born into the mafia. Also, didn't the... That there was the those clans and they all intermixed with each other. There was maybe six families that had come out of that part of Sicily. Those a couple of villages surrounded around uh, Catolica Heraclea, and they all interbred and intermarried together, and th- that tightened up all their ties together as a organized crime family. Yeah, and it's and they carried it over to Montreal too. This idea of you know family first, family comes first, blood's important. Uh, where, like as you pointed out, the with the American mafia it wasn't as much emphasis on uh, blood ties. Now let's talk about Vito himself and uh, what did Vito grow up in? What sort of uh, situation was he coming up in? They went to Montreal and he quickly got it. He quickly started working with uh, Dick Catroni. 
Uh, he was working under a gentleman named La Luigi Greco. He uh, ran the Sicilians basically within the Catroni organization. Yeah, Vito was just doing like he was doing, you know, stuff with his dad and learning the ropes. And Niccolo had a fierce rivalry with the Calabrian, uh, Calabrian, uh, Paolo Violi. And this became it was like a simmering feud that went on for a really long time but vic catroni he was a was a smart man he was as good at what he did uh was able to you know keep it from boiling over but vic Gendron, uh vic catroni got sick and it was basically who was going to be left to run the day-to-day -day operations of organized crime in montreal and it came down to nicolo and paulo uh violi and you know, Vic Controni, I understandably went with the Calabrian and Niccolo did not like this, obviously. The, the uh, Rizzuto family and the Sicilians, they they looked down on the Calabrians. They thought they were all, these guys are like second class gangsters. I'm not taking orders from these guys. And Niccolo with Rizzuto and, you know, the extended Rizzuto clan just started doing their own thing. They didn't weren't telling anybody. But they were doing they were doing their own side jobs and you know as we've gone in with the previous mafia episodes that that's a big no-no like the the structure is almost kind of like a roman army right like you can't just ignore the general and not tell the general what you're doing and what ended up happening is paulo violi saw that there was probably a war was going to break out very soon. He went to the Bonanno family to ask for more soldiers. They said, no, that's not going to happen. Um, so they tried one last ditch effort where they sat down and tried to hash out their differences. And that didn't work. That didn't really work out. So Niccolo took himself and the rest of his family down to Venezuela. It's interesting to me, too, that... And for a lot of these mafia guys, the Sicilians, Canada was almost a consolation prize for a lot of them. They couldn't actually emigrate into the U.S. So Canada was the next best place for them. Yeah. And I think with the Rizzuto is because of Nick's, uh, I think it was his grandfather had originally immigrated to the United States. And we're not going to get into a ton of details about that, but he ended up it did not work out well for him. He ended up getting, I think it was beaten with baseball bats and buried underneath a tree. And they only found his body because there was some storm that ripped out a tree <laughs> that like, you just never hear about him after. Also, it's really fascinating that in the turf uh, struggles in Canada, Toronto was under Buffalo, New York's control. The, the mafia out of Buffalo, New York, and Montreal was sort of a gray zone. Uh, Buffalo had some interests in there. New York had some interests. And it really wasn't until Vito stepped up that it more or less integrated into the greater mafia of the time. Steve here with a quick word from our sponsors. Yeah, I would say at this point that we're talking about, like the Bonat, the the. The Montreal area, I would say, is like a, it's an offshoot of the Bonanno family that changes later. But right now, I would say I would say that not now, nowadays, but the time we're talking is this is this is Bonanno turf. We also have to mention that in all of the big things that were going on, like the Appalachian Conference and a ton of other stuff, the some of these guys like Vic Catroni, they're right in the middle of all of it. Yeah, I don't think like and people don't really understand like what an important part Montreal was to the entire system that was going on in, down in New York. Like, you know, not to don't, at this point, like the Montreal family is, is small potatoes in comparison to the five families in New York. But like Montreal was crucial in terms of trafficking drugs. Um because the drugs would stop in Montreal. This is where Carmine Galante saw like, oh, this is, you know, this is how we're going to make a fortune. The, the, the drugs would stop in Montreal and then they would go from Montreal and then they would go to New York. One of the reasons for this is Canada 
has lighter sentences for drug trafficking in comparison to the states at the time. So you're less likely. I mean, people still got caught going across the border, but you're less likely to if you were to try to ship mass amounts of hashish or heroin or coke straight to New York. That is a really interesting point. And it was those connections that the Sicilians had to Marseille, the French connection to Sicily. It was just a uh, funnel of drugs that were going from Sicily and points east to uh, to France and then straight into Montreal. And it was just a uh, a cash register. And this, this is all way before anything with the Colombians and anything like that coming up from South America, even though that would start developing at this time. Yeah. And then the, the, with the Rizzuto clan, a lot of the drug connections happen. It, you would think like having a fleet of Venezuela would be all oh, like, you know, the, the Rizzutos are down, but it was probably one of the better things to happen to the family and their uh, their mafia, because this is where Niccolo Rizzuto starts making all the serious drug connections with the Caruana clan, who were a Sicilian family that had spread out into Venezuela and basically ran a, a drug cartel from there. And this is where Niccolo made all the connections. Uh, that pretty much lasted until, you know, the Rizzuto family's uh, demise. How does, what's the rise of, uh, A, how does Niccolo get back into the game after being, he has to go into more or less hiding in Venezuela, but then he comes back. How did the Rizzutos get back into Montreal and come out on top? Well, so Paulo Violi, yes, he was, um, I would say, I would say probably wasn't the smartest man in the world, but in general, like when he took over the running of the day-to-day operations, he just made a series of like serious blunders. Like one of them was there was an expo in Montreal and they provided um, much of the meat that was sold at this expo. And I believe it was 67, but the meat was tainted which immediately <laughs> everyone got sick from it. Right. And everybody knew who provided the meat. Right. So automatically in terms of the general population and the politicians, you're not doing yourself any favors by doing that. And then he ran, a, I believe it was like an ice cream parlor and he would rent, he rented out a room to a gentleman who happened to be an undercover police officer who basically wiretapped every conversation he had for years. And then this came out later and Violi's talking openly about, you know, deep secrets of the mafia in terms their connection to the Bananos and all the stuff that they're into. And this comes out and for obvious reasons, the rest of the mafia, greater mafia in New York and Montreal and around the world is none too happy about this. In a lot of ways, they kind of viewed it that he was breaking Omerta uh just as you know talking as openly as he was about a lot of the things that were going on and with the sicilians that were left there it it does break into a full-on war um and slowly uh paulo violi's extended family just starts getting killed one by one uh and there's debate like who was ordering some of these killings but a lot of people think it was rizzuto was ordering a lot of these killings and with the support of the Bonanno family and the, the greater mafia, because they weren't too happy with uh, Violi. Now, not to bog everybody down in too many dates, but around what time period is this playing out? Uh, around the seventies. Yeah. Early seventies is when it, it really starts kicking up. And this is really when we look in New York too, this is when drugs are coming into the full four that uh, the mafia has pretty much given up this whole idea of, oh, we're not into drugs. They're into drugs big time. Oh, yeah, especially the Bonanno family. Like, they're unique in the sense the Bonanno family, uh, in comparison to a lot of the other, we talked about it with the uh, Gambino family. Uh, Paul Castellano was like, oh, you got, you can't deal drugs. It's like a death. The Bonanno family just said, deal as much drugs as you want. Like they were bringing people straight from Sicily over to help with the drug trafficking. 
Um, they called them zips because the uh, I'm not a I'm I don't know I'm not Sicilian I'm not Italian but apparently according to these uh, Italian Americans they spoke really fast Sicilian so that's why they call them zips they also called them grease balls like <laughs> they weren't like super happy about having all these uh, I get you know act like true Sicilians coming over Carmine Galanti was uh, one of the guys that really pushed for a lot of them come over because he. He saw an opportunity to uh, kind of build his own personal mafia clan with all these uh, new Sicilians coming over. And from my understanding, a lot of what why they brought in these guys from Sicily is because they were tough as nails. They actually followed the rules because by the 70s, we're getting into second and even third generation mafia guys. Well, they're completely Americanized. They don't want to follow the Omerta and be tough guys and not look like, um, you know, look like peasants. They want to drive big old Cadillacs and wear fancy suits and show off and then not get as their hands as dirty as the, the Sicilians are coming in. Yeah, and it it caused a fair amount of conflict, from my understanding, because people were, people were, well, who are they loyal to? Are they loyal to their families back in Sicily, or are they loyal to us? And I mean, in some cases, they were loyal to the the families they adopted. In a lot of cases, they were still loyal to the families in Sicily. They were Sicilian, right? And and they basically focused just on drug trafficking from my understanding. Like I'm sure they did like a bunch of other stuff, but like kind of traditional mainstays of the American mob and even the Montreal, well, less so the Montreal mob. We'll get into that later, but the American, like racketeering, loan sharking, they weren't really interested in any of that stuff. They just wanted to move the heroin and the Coke. I think that I, I'm in that movie that we had talked about a while back on the live streams. Uh, uh, the, the gang that couldn't shoot straight the robert de niro character of this uh fish out of water italian who is sleeping on the floor and has no idea of american ways he's not that big of a stereotype from what i read in a lot of these books of the sicilians who are coming over yeah actually i didn't i didn't hadn't thought about that but yeah it would be accurate and, and it would also be kind of like how the uh, american mob would view these guys and how they would view the american mobs that the american mafia guys are just all americanized and they don't follow omerta anymore and they don't uh you know they're just all they become rich and fat and you can see that there's conflict between those two groups yeah and you can see like the sicilians being like like we're the true nico the coast of Nostra, like we're from where it started. Like you guys are just pretending to be ma mafia. We're actually mafia. You know, there was a lot of that too. With Montreal, maybe uh, let's stop and pause here because Montreal is a very unique place. It's it's in Canada, obviously, but it's French and it's English, and it has uh, influences from other French areas such as Haiti. There's a lot going on in the culture, especially the organized crime culture of Montreal. How does the, uh, the Rizzuto clan fit into this? Yeah, I would like for American audience, I'm trying to think of like a comparison. Um, I, like Montreal is kind of like the New Orleans of I don't Canada. even think that really works. There's Montreal as its own beast. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean in terms of like, just like a lot of different yeah. cultures that have been there for a really long time. Like I'd also say like Montreal is probably the most English out of all the Quebec cities. Right. Uh, like from just from personal experience, like if you go to Montreal and you're an English speaker, you'll, they'll speak English to you. But if you go to Quebec city, they just won't. Yeah. You're on your <laughs> right? own. Yeah. You're on your own. Right. Like Quebec city is really, French Canadian where Montreal it being a port like kind of like a port city and uh having like a lot of Anglo ties uh, it's it's a slightly different animal yeah I went uh years ago we went to Montreal and I went in with my best French of and the woman she's just like letting me go and letting me go and then she was like 
I speak English. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, uh, that's always been Montreal has always been pretty, uh, I don't know, one of the more, it, it is the most Anglo city in all of Quebec. There's a lot of French stuff though. And that leads to some conflict with the mafia. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess this is kind of like a little side note. It's not like a, I guess for the whole story, well, it is sort of like Vic Catroni was heavily involved in the politics in in Quebec. Um, he was like he'd literally have guys like show up with baseball bats to make sure people were voting the right way, right? <laughs> and then he had to stop doing that. Um, but um, he generally supported the Liberal Party of uh, of Quebec. Uh, we had a. I don't know, there's no way around it. It was like a terrorist attack, really, with the FLQ, who were French liberation, uh, like French, like French, French independence fighters, I guess you could say. And they kidnapped the, uh, I believe it was the labor, yeah, it was the labor minister um, of Quebec. And but they don't like they knew that they did it because they wrote a manifesto about it, everything. And they actually mentioned Vic Controni by name, saying, like, this is why this whole system is corrupt. Uh, and in their defense, uh, they weren't not they weren't lying, like Vic, Vic Controni and the mafia, and you know, just in general, were, were rigging elections. Um, they ended up killing this labor minister actually. and there was a huge crackdown in Quebec uh, in all, I believe that they called in like the military and everything like that. And they put the entire country on a military watch. Um, but at one point, like Vic Catroni actually went to the police and offered like, Hey, like we know people, you can try to find this guy. And the police were like, yeah, help us. <laughs> <laughs> and they obviously they never found him. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. This leads us into the the high water of Vito Rizzuto and the Rizzuto family in Montreal. What tell us about the the, the Rizzutos in Montreal and what it was like when they were really in control. Yeah, so Paolo Violi he ends up getting killed, which basically. The Rizzutos come in and fill that vacuum. And Vic Catroni stays is actually alive for a, a for a, quite some time after this. But basically, yeah, the Rizzutos come in and uh, uh, Nick Rizzuto, uh, Vito's dad, basically lets Vito start running uh, the day to day operations as he sees that his son's better at it than he does, than he is, right? And Vito starts immediately kicking into uh, trafficking tons and tons and tons of drugs. <laughs> and, um, basically has an entire mop and monopoly on drug trafficking in Montreal and much of the nation. What does that, how does that affect the, and how do the, how does the Montreal mafia at this point fit in with New York and the larger mafia scene? They're on the rise for sure, right? At this point, but they're still they're still part of the Bonanno family, right? They're still kind of an offshoot of the Bonanno family. Um, but they're definitely on the rise. Like at one point, Vito almost gets caught, you know, shipping, I think it I believe it was 16 tons of hashish. 16 tons, you know, he ends up getting off on the charges, which is he gets the nickname the the Canadian Teflon Don, which kind of drives me nuts. We should have just gave him a different, <laughs> different name instead of copying the Americans. What does uh, now eventually Vito gets involved in a lot of stuff in New York and he even gets uh, brought up on charges in the U S what's happened. What happens with that? Oh, so yeah, the internal conflict in the Bonanno family, which is, I think we've mentioned this before, the Bonanno family has always been kind of one of the crazier families in terms of uh, just internal conflict and civil wars breaking out and like Capos going rogue and uh, Ristelli, he ends up uh, going to jail or he's going to go to jail and uh, these three Capos 
uh, see an opportunity that they're going to, you know, take over the Bonanno family. But Joe Massino, who uh, is a famous mafia guy, he's actually known as the last uh, godfather of the last Don, uh, decides that he's going to stay loyal to Rosselli uh, because he's going to inherit the uh, Bonanno family by doing this. And they ask uh, Vito to take part of the execution of these three uh, Bonanno family capos. And what happens? Well, they show up and uh, George from Canada or George Shasha, who was uh, part of the Bonanno family, uh, sets it up and tells these guys, tells the uh, Vito and the two other guys to stay in the closet. And you'll see when I run my hair, hands through my hair, come out, start shooting. And they, uh, yeah, they shoot them. They kill them all. And there's a connection there, but if I'm not mistaken, between Donnie Brasco, who which we'll get to at some point, where uh, Sonny Red, he was one of the people who got whacked in that big hit. Yeah, it's it's depicted in the movie Donnie Brasco. It's not accurate to how this shooting went down, but it's a pretty famous scene that was depicted in the in that movie. Um, and it's brutal, <laughs> but I'm sure like the actual events were brutal too. But I think it's uh, they really took a lot of liberties with the Donnie Brasco one. Yeah, I don't think they portrayed Vito Rizzuto at all. No, we, in Donnie it was Brasco just... or no mention of him whatsoever. No, no mention of them. It like it doesn't take place at a restaurant either. It takes place in a basement. Um, I don't, I don't know really why. I mean, it, the scene is cool in the movie, but I don't really understand why they added that scene in the movie. But I mean, it works in the movie. Yeah, it would have been cool to get, and I will definitely address that more so uh, without getting too far off the field because we could go off in a million different directions. But let's get back to Vito. Now, Vito winds up catching some serious time in the U.S. in jail. What happens there? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we're skipping. Yeah, okay. So, he does those murders and he he, he goes up pretty high in the Bonanno family, obviously, right? Uh, pretty much saved the family. Um and during this whole time, he's he's dealing drugs, he's doing loan sharking, he's getting involved in construction. Vito has his, he's getting his fingers in everything in Montreal. Um, the and is slowly becoming more and more independent from the Bonanno family. I, from my understanding, I believe it, up until uh, like later on or what have you, he was still sending a little bit of tribute to the Bonanno family. But it gets to the point where. The Rizzuto family is probably more powerful than any of the New York families because a lot of the New York families, they got busted, right? When Paul, when uh, John Gotti went down, they all just started falling like a house of cards because everyone just started talking. They didn't really have this problem in Canada. The, um, you know, very rarely were people getting caught. So, yeah. So just to set up to the getting to this point, um, Somebody in the Bonanno family, a good looking Sal, turns informant and says that um, Vito was part of the, the murders of these three capos. And yeah, this, he ends up getting charged, charged with these murders, um, which just kind of it's funny because the Canadian government tried tons of different ways to charge Vito with something and they couldn't do it. And it was ended up actually being the Americans that charged Vito. Then Vito gets, he gets ser a serious prison sentence. What happens in Montreal when he's in the can? Yeah. So Vito ends up having to go to a supermax prison in Colorado. I'm trying to remember. Is the... it Lawrence? I think it might Lawrence, have been. Yes. That's what it did. I think Gotti wound up going there. And that's a couple of the really big names of uh, criminal justice have gone through Florence Supermax. Yeah, from my understanding, it's like for the worst of worse, right? Like if, you know, Hannibal Lecter was a real person and terrorists and it, it's it's really rough from my understanding. Like it's not a good time at all. Uh, yeah, he ends up going there. I believe it was uh, five years he was there for. 
And as soon as Vito leaves, the all basically all hell breaks loose. Uh, there's power struggles. Uh, uh, I think at one point, like uh, there was a French Canadian, Renard uh, Desjardins. Um, that's my attempt at trying to sound French. Uh, <laughs> um, was kind of like running the thing uh, for a bit. Uh, but like Vito's son gets killed. His father gets killed. Um, the Hell's Angels start fighting the Rock Machine, which is during all of this, there's a huge biker war going on, right? And Vito's trying to like, trying to manage all of this. The best way I get, I'm trying to think of like a comparison, like Vito is like the consummate like politician in the sense he's trying to, he set up this system where everyone was kind of all working together. So like the Sicilians were responsible for getting the drugs there. The Hells Angels were kind of responsible for distributing the drugs throughout all the gangs and like the Haitians predominantly but it wasn't just Haitians but the street gangs were responsible for just actually you know getting the product to the customer like the street stuff and everyone was kind of happy with this arrangement for the most part because everyone was getting a cut of the pie and I mean the Rizzutos were obviously the most happy because they were making the most amount of money and they were taking the least amount of risk but once Vito goes out of that picture it, it all just kind of collapses. These uh, these different gangs, obviously gangs are jealous and they want more the power. What happens when Vito gets back? Does it is Vito able to just slide back in? Hey, guys, I'm back. Let's uh, resume where we were at. Or does he have to really fight to get back in control of Montreal? Well, he you know, he comes back and it's. I mean, this is what makes the story so fascinating because it, it it almost seems like something out of a John Wick movie. Like he comes back <laughs> and he he hangs out he hangs out in Toronto for I believe it's a month, and then he he uh, goes back to Montreal and comes to the conclusion. It's like you know what? I don't even care about the money anymore. I just want revenge. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all the people that just let this happen and my son dying and my father getting killed uh and the, just immediately bodies start dropping and it's interesting that he wasn't the bodies that were dropping weren't necessarily people that were against them they, they were people that were supposed to be supporting the Rizzuto family it didn't show enough loyalty or had just straight up betrayed him while he was in prison thinking that he was just never going to come back and he comes back and yeah, the body starts dropping like something out of a John Wick movie, really. Like Vito's not doing it himself, but it's he he doesn't even care about the money when he comes back. He just wants to he wants revenge. Like kind of an old I guess you think like stereotypical like Sicilian mafia vendetta type stuff, right? Like in the movie The Godfather. But it it's true. This is what actually happened. And we and don't know what we don't know what would happen. We don't know how far he he could have gone. Maybe he could have taken over Montreal again, but he ended up uh, succumbing to, I believe it was uh, lung cancer. He was a lifelong smoker. That's what's crazy is he dies, uh, Vito dies of uh, natural causes, or at least there were some rumors floating around that he may have been uh, poisoned or something. But by all, uh, by all accounts, it was a natural causes and he was pretty young at the time 67 i want to say and it would have been interesting to have seen if he had lived a little bit longer what he could have done but in the aftermath there's no what if in this situation montreal just completely it goes from organized crime to a disaster yeah completely disorganized um or really well i mean the mob the there's a war going, it's still going on to this day, uh, within the, uh, within the Italian mafia, uh, the hell's angels had pretty much won their war against the rock machine. They're the, 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 the top dog now in Montreal, but, uh, like, I guess it must be kind of embarrassing for these, uh, Italian, for the Sicilian mafia that's left in Montreal. They have to like pretty much kind of pay tribute to the, 
Hell's Angels now. Um, but like Vito kind of had war. Like, it's funny, like John Gotti, when he went to jail, he said, like, you guys are making a big mistake. Like, it's all you're going to miss John Gotti. And Vito pretty much said the same thing, too. It's like, well, you guys don't really know what you're doing. Like, you, like I'm the only one that's, like, kind of keeping this tame and stopping these these crazy wars from breaking out. And, I mean, it kind of is the truth, right? Like, it's disorganized crime in Montreal right now. Um, and then especially when the five families went down in New York, it a lot of uh, low-end crime, like, you know, people holding up liquor stores and stuff of that nature and you know old ladies getting their purses robbed that's broke out too that is one thing that you can't there's always unintended consequences and i think there's always this idea with the uh law enforcement that if we take out the top guy then everything else is just gonna it's going to be uh uh utopia no crime on the streets and they ignore that they're just causing power vacuums that is going to cause even more violence and i really don't think they look at it that way no i don't i don't really no well otherwise they would have like kind of seen i guess you're kind of putting the rock in the hard place it's like oh well, who's tra- you know who's trafficking all the drugs into the city well it's vito rizzuto right but no one's going to be trafficking the drugs, right? Like the only way you're going to actually really stop people trafficking drugs into the city is if you start doing like immediate death penalties where people are like, I'm going to die if I'm caught trafficking drugs, right? Like that's really the only way you're going to do it. And is that, is that going to even really solve it? I think it would probably, it would help probably. But it's, I mean, it's, in a lot of places that have completely shut off drug abuse it's through those draconian means the and um i believe it was in communist china that's what they did to end the opium dens and uh afghanistan or whether it was the taliban or whoever had taken on the pashas or whatever if they wanted to stop it you had to pretty much kill everyone and obviously living in Western liberal democracies, that's not going to fly. And it's also not going to fly just busting up street dealers and then letting the uh, silk tie types off. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it is, it's a rock and a hard place situation that in a lot of ways, there's not much that the government can really do. Should they have left Vito there or should they have taken him out? I don't know. It it really gets into that. I mean, we've talked about it in previous episodes of this. I've talked with other uh, people on episodes about drugs. It, it really is a whack-a-mole situation. They stomped yeah. down on one thing and end it. The, they were very successful in destroying the Italian mafia and their hold on the drugs. And then the cartels bumped up and they used, they start putting a clamp on the cartels. And from China, they're, you're able to send in a little package of fentanyl the size of a cell phone that can be cut into endless amounts of street drugs. And it's the next thing that they have to try and figure out. And you're always three steps behind what the the criminal innovators are doing. Well, I mean, in terms of Montreal too, like they cry, you know, the Rizzuto family is really not much of anything anymore. Um, but like the Adrangata in Southern Ontario just kind of filled that vacuum to a degree. Right. And they became a lot more powerful. I mean, even they, they, even the Italian government's like, Oh, they crap. They, you know, they, uh, they clamped down on the La Cosa Nostra in, in, in Sicily, but the Camorra and the Andrangheta just kind of filled that void too. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. Now let's put, let's leave it in here. We, we could talk a lot, lot more about Vito Rizzuto in depth, but we are going to tackle our first series television series in the next few episodes where we're going to actually talk about bad blood and break down some of the episodes and talk about the individual activities that were in that first series of bad blood. 
and get into the history and talk about how it was portrayed. So I am really, really excited to get into this story and a little bit of a change of format that we're going to get into. Yeah, this episode, we just kind of wanted to give people like a light overview, you know, leading up, like how did Vito get all his money? You know, what was Montreal before the Rizzutos, the, the connection to the Bananos? Because on the in the TV show, they the uh, I've watched it and it, it and it's not perfectly clear because the TV show is mainly focused on, you know, what happens after when Vito goes to jail. Right. So uh, during the TV show episodes, you're going to be talking about the Hells Angels and the Rock Machine and the Adrangata and the West End Gang and the, the street gangs as they come up. And we'll go into more detail with that. This is just kind of a light overview. I would suggest to the audience, though, is uh, there's a book called The Sixth Family, which uh, goes through the uh, the entire history of the Rizzuto family. And it, it's quite well done. So if you want to, you know, do a little background research yourself as we're going along in this series, I would suggest reading that book. Yeah, that's a great one. And then there's a postscript to the the whole story of uh, about one of the people who tried to take over from Rizzuto called Nikki Scarpa, I believe. And uh, that's a really good book if you want to get ahead of the game and see what happens after Rizzuto. But I want to thank everybody for listening. Send in your questions, your comments. We'd love to hear your iTunes reviews. So send those in five star better than others. But uh, thank you again. Send in your questions, your comments, and your feedback. And if you have any ideas, we would love to hear them. So we will talk to you next time. Yep. See you guys. Get ready. This is going to be a fun series.